Isaac lacked the tools. And the slaves we are looking at today, they lacked the tool. That was the same problem. They were not raised to be adventurous. Their lives full of complaint, complaint, complaint. They lacked coping mechanism. If things go a little bit out of order, they become disorientated. Moses painfully delivered them from sudden death from the hand of God because God got so tired and said, give me a chance, I want to wipe all of them out and raise a new race through your descendants. Moses, who was aching because of the offense they caused him, painfully had to plead and deliver them. And he himself suffered a great loss because of the attitude of this people. Listen to his farewell speech as he was about to climb the mountain where God was going to take his life. He said, the Lord was also angry with me for your sakes, saying, even you shall not go in there. You will not go into the promised land. It was because of this people. Leading these people was like, our people say, if you wrestle with a foolish man, your whole body will be covered with sand. We do native wrestling. If you wrestle with a fool, because he's just rolling on the sand anyhow, your own body will be full of sand. In the same manner, strange and pure and uh, uh, wrong orientation in somebody who is getting into marriage with another person, it is going to make the marriage more tasky. It is like getting a cart. You tie a horse to the front. You tie another horse to the back. This horse is dragging backwards. This one is dragging forward. That's what it will look like. When orientation doesn't even come close. This person was raised like wild animal. Whereas this person was given decent orientation or training in life. My parents taught me and taught me and taught me. And us, rather. My father was a good storyteller like me. He would tell us stories about his forefathers, about his half uncles and half, because our grandfather married many. Great grandfather married many, so relatives. He would show us how they all ended up. My, father, my grandfather had many brothers. No one, you can't see anyone now, any of the descendants of our grandfather's brothers. They all wasted away. Drunkenness. Foolishness. The father was told one died in Yola. He was a washerman. And nobody knew where he was buried. So our father will tell you this. Thing. My so-so uncle did this. This was how he ended up. So you must not do this. You must not do that. I was taught about wasting things. You don't waste anything in our family. You don't finish bathing yourself. You take the tablet of soap and put it inside water. Or soap dish that is having some water. Because when you come back, that tablet of soap, a portion of it has melted away. My father will nearly kill you. So I was taught that from my childhood. If I will have reason to go to mama's spot to take soup, I was taught the measure I should take. Now, I have been trusted with a whole pot of soup. And you know, making our type of soup is very costly. Mama is going to market and it tells you. So, so time in the morning, heat up the soup. We never had fridge. We never had freezer. 
And you are the responsible boy at home. And Mama had told you what the clock will be saying when you go to heat up the soup. Do you know what? I will think that if the second hand passes that time, the soup will even get sour. So, almost every minute I'm coming and watching it. Is it time? Is it time? And exactly that time I'll start eating that soup. That's orientation. That's what it means to be responsible. And I raised my own children. As a man or as, a young, as somebody growing up, we never lived in a house, not even a compound at her tap. We had to go to public tap and all that. We never lived with electricity. We used bush lamp. But my children had the privilege. Now there is top tap running in the house. There is electricity. And I taught them, look, if you are not in this room, the children's room, switch off the light. Because any time a light is on, the meter is reading, and I'm the one going to pay it. So don't allow me to enter that room with the light on when you are doing nothing there. Whether there is water or not, turn off the tap. You don't turn it, and there's no water, you leave it like that, so that when water comes, it's splashing everywhere and wasting away. I taught my children. Now, how do you expect me to live peacefully with a life, a, a wife, whose orientation is totally opposite this one I'm talking about? Some people have the orientation of eat and drink today for tomorrow we die. And perhaps some of you here, that's your philosophy. You don't care about tomorrow. No, sufficient unto the day is evil, is the evil thereof. Good, it's in the Bible. Have you not also seen the place that say, go to the ants and learn lesson? They have no leader, no commander. And in summer, they gather their food and save for rainy season. So it is. The whole world to the whole world. If you read this one, read this, read the other one. That's how to live with scripture. If you want to destroy yourself with scripture, you will find scriptures that will help you destroy yourself. If I make the mistake and marry somebody who believes, let's eat everything today and allow tomorrow to take care of himself. You believe because I'm G.O. I will turn into angel. And I'm going to live with this woman. When I go hear her voice. So. <laughs> Hallelujah. Marriage is not all about having bedtime fun. So brothers and sisters, lecture your children. Equip them for life. This life is complex. So you must go to school of life to know how to survive. The rat race here is killing. I was raised to know how to judiciously spend my money. When you see the number of cars I have, you think, oh, our Gio is a multimillionaire. No! I manage everything I have. You know, I have ML Mercedes car. I tried to find out the age. We bought it 16 years ago. I've had it for 16 years, that ML. And I didn't buy it brand new. People used it for years, discarded it. I went to Kotonu and bought it. And for the past 16 years, I've been driving that car. I go to government house with it and people still respect me when in it because of how I handle it. Even things I wear, I take care of them. I don't just get this, I put it into water. 
All the suits you see me wearing here, no one has entered water. In those days, I would sweat, sweat, sweat. Of course, not knowing how to take care of my armpit, the smelling. I soak it in water. By the time I bring it out, it's like a hunter's coat. But now I know how to handle it. I know how to wash well, put deodorant that has antibacterial something. And you, I perceive it, and I know it is still clean. I save it from water. Hallelujah. When I see you, sister, this brand new wrapper, you are sitting on a pavement covered with dust. And I say, sister, that place is dust you. You just get up. Daddy, I'm going to wash it. I know you have not learned lesson. You don't use that Hollandis and you're sitting inside dust. When I was nearly 20, my mother brought out a wrapper. She called me Chibike. This was the wrapper I tied the day I went to dedicate you in church. Shout hallelujah. Mama gave special treatment to her wrappers. There are common ones she could afford to wash. But there were, there were some that never saw water. 20 years. She'll bring them out. You know, when a woman is walking, wrapper is rubbing off all the pomade, the grease they put on themselves. She will bring out, and that area that rubs off, they said, carefully, you know, wash off the grease, sun all of them, put it in a special box with comfort, and all that. And when she brings it out, it looks brand new. Because they don't have money to be buying and buying and buying. Special occasions, they pull them out. It's still looking fresh and new. The disparity between Moses and the people he was leading was too much. God nearly destroyed these Hebrews and Moses lost the promised land. Many marriages are suffering today. And relationships are in deep struggle because of orientation. Business partner and business partner. Things are not working. Somebody is destroying while somebody is trying to make this thing go forward. The problem bothers on orientation. In those days, People like us married for better, for worse. But today, because of better, for best orientation, they are separating. What is causing the problem? Orientation. In a foreign country, we met with a, one of the daughters of our elder. On Hanele here, one of the daughters. And she told my wife and I that she was alarmed at the rates Christian marriages are breaking off. She lives in Lagos. She said in their church now, the latest one was a brother who divorced the wife because she was not there at Christmas to cook for the for the husband. It's just two of them. And when you listen to the story, I discovered that that girl was very foolish. Your elder brother is a multimillionaire. Your elder brother is going to kill a cow. And perhaps to supplement with some goods. All kinds of friends are coming. Your senior brother's place will be the center of the thing. And your husband is saying, I want a quiet Christmas. My wife, I want us to spend this Christmas alone in our house. We don't have children yet. If I can provide frozen fish, I want you to cook it, prepare it so that we can eat. I don't want to go to your brother's house. 
I don't belong to their clique. I want to be my poor man in my house. Let us spend this Christmas in quietness. And the wife said, no way. Follow me, let's go to my brother's house and celebrate Christmas. And the husband said, no way, I'm not going. If you are not going now, since you like suffering, I'm going. Don't go. If you don't take care of me this Christmas, this marriage is ended. Because her mother never told her, my daughter, when you marry, it is not us that matter. It's not your senior brother, the multimillionaire, that matters. It is your husband. Take care of your husband. She went to the senior brother place, and after eating and drinking and coming back, the door has been padlocked. She thought it was a joke. Marriage is ended. You don't come with stupidity and craziness and you don't know what it means that you are under a man. You want your brother's money to be ruling. But a good mother Resist the daughter and tells her the real meaning of life. Hallelujah. So here today, I am here to warn you. Mind how you raise your sons and how you raise your daughters. Who wouldn't be happy to have well-trained, well-groomed person as a partner? Many, many years ago, perhaps up to 20 years ago, I finished preaching in our former headquarters. I gave word of knowledge concerning a marriage that is about to break. We closed. A brother greeted me. And after greeting me, he says, sir, I'm coming into your office to show you. That word of knowledge you gave concerns me and my wife. He went to his car, pulled out his diary, met me in the office, opened it. He says, I see the date. I wrote this thing this morning. Our marriage is ended. My wife is very dirty. If you enter our kitchen, it's like where pigs live. You enter my bedroom, it is stinking. My wife is smelling. My wife cannot do this. My wife cannot take care of herself. My wife cannot wash. My wife cannot. Everywhere is dirty. I am tired. And I looked at him. I said, but did you tell me this before? He said, no. I said, God saw you are going to make a mistake. Go back. So mothers, can't you teach your daughters how to be clean? Can't you teach your daughters? Look at my senior brother here. He was the firstborn. Well, the, the firstborn was a girl who died, and he came, and he was like the first girl in the family. There was nothing my senior brother didn't do. You know, this are you soak it in the water, it decomposes, you go to sieve it, then they will do it, then they will pound, then they will cook, then they will wash. Mama's things and so he lived like a woman. It was one time he took me, he wanted me to go to the to the river to wash and to sieve apple, and I refused. And he carried me on his head. <laughs> And we are fighting every inch of the way. I'm not going. <laughs> By one bush corner, I dropped from his head. My knee hit the ground. And a thorn entered a joint between the kneecap and the other bone. Broke inside. I couldn't move my knee. He carried me to the river. Finished everything. 
and carried me back. Can't even remember who carried his, his other things. My knees swore and swore and swore. Nobody treated you in those days. Until this stone turned white. Pus was coming out. It was pressed and it came out. It was then I learned you have to respect their day. <laughs> he would remember this now. But I suffered for perhaps over a week. So, raise your children, the boys. Don't allow them to become, you know, and, and wankere boys. Running around like those rural dogs from morning to night. No assignments, nothing given to them to do. Just running around. Come back and eat, go out and run about. You are raising people to become irresponsible. I've read it before. Train up a child the way he should go. And when he's grown, he's not going to depart from it. The people Moses was leading were raised to be slaves. And he was expecting them to be responsible. No, it's not going to work. This irresponsibility, inability to face challenges of life, it wasn't going to go out of them. It had become part of their body. But Moses was expecting them to become magicians, to change overnight and start behaving otherwise. I decided I'm not going to raise my children as rich people do. I decided I'm not going to do that. Where we live now is called Shepherd's Court. When we are building it, I was determined I'll be a laborer there. My sons will be laborers there. I decided I'll give my children all round training. This is because life is full of vagaries, ups and downs. As I was growing up, I've, I've experienced it twice. First was 19, was it 1956? Uh, when, when Queen Elizabeth came to Nigeria as a young queen, that was 1956 or 57, where my father built his 24 rooms are rented out, built our own semi flat where we lived. They say it was on crown land. And when the queen is passing with her motorcade, she will look at that side on plant. It was like a slum, and that that will offend her. Government demolished everything there, including my father's property. We lived in a semi-flat where we are reduced to two rooms. Papa and Mama living in the bedroom, and the rest of us in the small, tiny room. Our father nearly died. We are like people who fell from mountain and fell into the, into the valley. Papa knew he wasn't going to survive it. My father was a go-getter. Anything that would make him work hard and stand on his own, not living in a rented house, he was going to do it. He rode his bicycle 15 miles away to a place called Obibo. Found a place rented for us. Put us in school there. He was working in Port Harcourt living in one tiny room facing the sanitary way. A few times we saw cockroach in Papa's pot of soup. The man continued struggling. He bought land there, started developing, became landlord, renting out. Everybody started calling him Nayuku again. When we got there, Every, almost virtually every night. So their aunts will wake us in the night. Bite us to hell. We will be burning tires and pursuing them. They will break. I go to class. All of us are dozing because we didn't sleep in the night. We went through that and we learned that life is not 
a bed of roses. We went through that. Rose again. Became a family everybody respected. Then the war came. Life scattered again. People were making soup with cassava leaves. We started going through suffering. And people who were not used to suffering, they soon died away. But we survived. Hallelujah. So I know that this is how life is. And I didn't want to raise my children to believe that life is a bed of roses. During long vacation, as we were building Shepherd's Court, the two boys went every day to sight with me. Monday to Saturday, every day they walked, carrying blocks, carrying concrete, and everything, like every other laborer. I remember my headquarters pastor then, the wife, because school was about to resume after the long back. He says, look at how Nat is. He has lost weight. You should have given him two weeks to recover before going back to school. How can he go back to school like this? <laughs> I laughed. I said, if he, gets to if he gets back to school and they drive him home, let him come back. If they say his father is a very poor man who couldn't feed him, so let it be. They walked and walked. Of course, I was paying them. Perhaps not exactly how much I paid other laborers. But they were saving body. Hallelujah. That's the way I raised my own children. They had a friend who would always come because they love our house. And we are getting up in the morning to go to work. That's when he will cover his head to do and be sleeping. He never said one day, lend me walking clothes, let me follow you. Not one day. Then the minute we come back, yeah, join and eat and enjoy. And I knew how he was going to end. Up to today, when he runs into this trouble, he contacts my son. And we say, Dad, can you give Susu amount to Susu person? And when you come here, I'll pay you back. It has continued. When you see somebody you know, striving and pushing and making it in life, find out how was he raised. Hard work does not kill. Tell your neighbor, hard work does not kill. It rather toughens us up for the rough roads we had ahead of us. Joe went out to study, and it was in January when snow was pouring left and right. He had no car. The first email he sent me said, Dad, I would have said, buy me a ticket, let me come back. I have suffered. But if not for the training you gave me, I would have begged you to allow me to come back. I'm getting adapted. Thank you for the training you gave me. Shout hallelujah. What type of orientation are you giving your children? Sister, do you allow your teenage daughter to be watching TV when you are cooking? You came back from the market and your daughter is watching her popular program and you are in the kitchen cooking alone. Is that what you are doing? I need to expel you from this church. It was said some years ago, that a, a girl, a copper, who never made soup before, from a big family, there are, fam there are servants all over. She made a pot of soup with a gallon of vegetable oil. Do you blame her? It was either in Newswatch or Quality Magazine or whatever. True story. 
She never cooked before. And her first experience was making a pot of stew with a gallon of vegetable oil. Big man, reduce the number of servants you put in your house. Allow your children to learn something. Your daughter cries, your young daughter cries. You push one egg into the mouth. Ada, stop crying. Jennifer, don't cry again. And you put egg inside. And your little son cries a little bit. Oh, yeah, take money. Go buy sweet. You are destroying that child. Let me tell you what you should do. There is something called piggy bank. How many of you know what piggy bank is? Yeah. You go to places, they sell pottery. It's a round pot with a tiny hole. A child can throw in money there, but the child cannot bring out the money. You buy it, give your son or daughter. And say, look, I want to see how much you can save from now to the end of the year. You've been asking me for bicycle? Yes. Yeah. Start saving your money. Any money anybody gives you. If I, I'll be giving you more money now. When I give you money, or if this store gives you money, or somebody gives you money, put it into this hole. It will get into this pot. At the end of the year, we'll break it to see how much you have saved. When you break it, you've broken it. When we break it, I will double it and let's see if it can buy you a bicycle. If it doesn't buy you a bicycle, I'll put it in the bank. you start again next year and I'll be doubling it for you until we buy you a bicycle. Give your child a challenge. Let them learn how to save. That is what life is all about. Shall we all rise now?